Welcome everybody. As Oregon's Business Bank, we are proud to be able to host Dr. Bill Connerly for our clients, our future clients, and community members. We like to say bankers sometimes forget that they're businesses. We really think of ourselves as a growing Oregon business that just happens to be a bank. And to that end, we were very pleased to report our fiscal year and results yesterday before the market opened. Summit Bank experienced overall growth in assets of 50% for the year, ending at 761 million in total assets. We are proud to be now the third largest bank headquartered in our state of Oregon. Net income was up 41% to 8 million. And the bank is built on a very strong foundation of over $60 million in capital. We we're equally proud of our work in 2020 by helping over 440 Oregon businesses through the PPP loan process. Those loans enabled nonprofits and businesses to retain their employees or hire them back. And we figured that was thousands. We wanna thank all the businesses, nonprofits and individuals who work with us. And we look forward to working hard every day to continue to earn your business. And with that, I'm gonna now introduce the main event, uh, Dr. Bill Connerly. Before I do that though, if you do have questions, uh, please input them in the Q&A section. Dr. Bill Connerly connects the dots between the economy and business decisions. I think we've all heard him and that is true. He's a senior contributor to Forbes.com, holds a PhD from Duke and has over 30 years of helping businesses address challenging economic conditions. Dr. Connerly is the author of two books, including The Flexible Stanch, which explains how to run your business if you don't believe his forecast. He has spoken to business audiences from Moscow, Idaho to Moscow, Russia. He's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and even the Land of the Week. He's a father of two sons and the husband of one wife. It's my pleasure again to introduce Dr. Bill Connerly. Thank you, Craig. Wonderful to be here with all of you virtually. I was chatting with a buddy of mine who runs a mid-sized company, and he says, this is, must be a hard time to be an economist, hard time to be a forecaster. And I, of course, said, uh, yeah, that's uh, certainly the case. And uh, then he said, I wouldn't want your job. But I had to tell him, I said, you do have my job kind of. You don't write down a numerical forecast and you don't go talking about your forecast, but every business decision is about the future. And so every business decision requires a vision of what that future is going to look like. It may be a murky vision. Uh, we may not be quite sure what is going on, but every business leader needs to have a vision of the future in order to make today's decisions and tomorrow's decisions. What I'm going to do is share with you my vision of the economy to help you get a sense of what's going on. And uh, let me give you a plan for the overall, um, hold on a second, working with the technology, there we go, a, a plan for the overall presentation. I'm going to be talking about uh, the growth that I believe is going to happen in 2021 and 2022. I do think that we're going to be better this year than in 2020, <laughs> but isn't that kind of a low bar? Most any year without a major war would be better than uh, 2020 was, but I think we're going to have growth. So if you're anxious to run out and get an early lunch, you can leave right now, uh, 2021 going to be better. There has been some political change in Washington, D.C. I'm going to talk about that and how it will impact businesses, including companies here in Oregon. And then I'm going to talk about our land use challenge here in Oregon. I believe that there will be some uh, persistent changes from the pandemic, even after the disease is behind us, there will be changes in how we work, how we live, and that will set up a 
a disagreement about Oregon's land use policy. Uh, I'm gonna leave time for uh, questions and answers at the end. On the bottom of your Zoom screen is a, um, an icon for Q&A. Please use that. Um, it's easier if we put them all in one place. So put it in the Q&A, not the chat, and we'll address as many of those as we can as we move on. So let's talk about what the economy is doing. This is a picture of uh, the US economy, GDP, gross domestic product, inflation adjusted. And those of you who check the news knows we got that latest observation released today, a 4% growth at an annual rate. And the point here is that we had a very severe dip in the second quarter. The worst uh, month was April. And then we've had a rebound that was partial but sharp, uh, sharp but partial rebound. In, and that's the dollar side of the economy. If we look at employment, employment actually had a more significant decline. And the reason it had a more significant decline was because uh, the people who lost their jobs were mostly lower wage workers, not entirely, but mostly. So the dollar impact was less than um, the uh, number of workers impact. And that's not to minimize that uh, those people really were impacted. But for those of us who are uh, keyed to the overall size of the economy, uh, it's that dollar impact that's a little bit more important. So the key point is uh, the overall economy is better than you would think just by looking at the employment numbers. Now, what has driven the downturn and the recovery, of course, is COVID, and I'm going to talk about uh, hospitalization. At first, we were talking about cases, but you know that testing has been inconsistent. We didn't have enough tests, and in some cases, we still don't. There's variation in testing, so I'm looking at hospitalization. What we're really most concerned with is... Um, I'm sorry, I think I uh, muted myself. <laughs> uh, I know many of you would like me to do that, but uh, I'm not gonna do it for this, th this version. We're gonna talk about mortality. And the reason we're talking about mortality, you know, that that's what counts. But mortality is not an apples to apples measure over time because the doctors and nurses and other health professionals have done a really good job at, at saving lives. They've learned new techniques and we also have some new treatments. So mortality is down, but the hospitalization number is the thing that gives us a measure of where we are. The third wave nationally was very bad, but look at Oregon. Uh, Oregon has done much better than the nation. Uh, we've always been better than the nation. And um, there we go. Uh, always been better than the nation. And I think that's going to continue. Uh, we started declining before the, the nation started declining in this third wave. Uh, well, I'll talk about vaccines in, in a moment and why I'm optimistic about that. Here in Oregon, uh, we've had the same general pattern as the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And I know people really want to know about my community. I want to, you know, I live in Bend or Eugene or Portland. I want to know about those communities. But the fact of the matter is these charts would look the same, whether we were in Croatia or South Korea or the United States. So it's all pretty much uh, the same story. This chart shows the, uh, Changes benchmarked from uh, January 2018, so we can put uh, areas of different size on the same chart. The blue line is the United States, and that's a good benchmark. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what's been going on in our different communities served by uh, Summit Bank. Bend in the brown line, or maybe that's a gold line, has been going faster growing faster than the nation, growing faster than the rest of Oregon for the last few years. A friend of mine who lives there said it's a, a, a Zoom town, but actually uh, Bend was booming before we started Zooming. And it was 2018 and 2019 when Ben really took off. Since then, uh, Ben's job count declined uh, as did you know the rest of the country, but Bend has had more of a rebound. 
I'm optimistic about Bend in the future, but I do not see a really sharp rise in Bend's economy because a sharp rise would require housing. Now, a lot of people want to move to Bend, but uh, it's hard to find a place um, to live. If somebody uh, waved a magic wand over Bend and added 10,000 housing units, I think that they would fill up immediately and the population and then employment would grow. But Bend will be constrained by housing growth. The, the developers there seem to be doing a, a, a job, but you can only build houses so fast. So I'm optimistic about boom, but I think that the sharpest growth is maybe behind it for a little while. Now let's talk about, um, what are we going to talk about next? Portland. Yeah, Portland. So Portland was doing better than the nation, better than the Oregon average in 2018, 2019. Had a decline uh, like the rest of the country, um, but its rebound has been a little bit softer. And I'm wondering, gee, why is Portland a little softer? But if you put 60 or 100 major cities from across the country in this kind of chart, there'd be variation. And I think what we're seeing is normal variation. Portland is maybe at the lower end of that Portland, uh, of that normal variation. But there is a concern that Portland's a little bit different than the rest of the country. Uh, the riots in particular have uh, led real estate developers to drop their estimates of uh, the attractiveness of Portland. Uh, there's also, of course, the severe um, homelessness problem on top of high housing prices. I think that Portland is going to get its act together, but it's going to take a change in uh, the attitudes of the, the leaders. And I'm not just talking political leaders, but also the business leaders, civic leaders, nonprofit leaders. Uh, there needs to be an attitude that, hey, uh, things have not been going in the right direction. If you're interested in more detail about my Portland view, uh, an article just came out that I wrote on Forbes.com today. If you just Google Connerly, Forbes, Portland, it'll show up at the top. The bottom line is, I think that, for, that Portland is not dying, but um, I raised the question, uh, can you die by shooting yourself in the foot? And the answer is yes, if you don't seek treatment. And I think Portland has a, uh, a decent future ahead of it, growing at about the pace of the national economy, but it needs to seek treatment for the problems that it has. And now let's talk about Eugene. Eugene is the line in green. It had a picture kind of like everybody else, but a much slower recovery from the um, pandemic. I think what's going on is students. And uh, when people had to work from home, most people across the country who could work from home were working from home at home. But for college students working at home, does that mean in the dorm? Does that mean in your campus, you know, off-campus apartment? Or does it mean moving back to mom and dad? And um, maybe to the happiness of parents or the unhappiness of parents, a number of students move back with mom and dad, somebody to cook for them, do laundry, perhaps. Uh, so I think that is what's going on in Eugene um, maybe more so than any underlying economic concerns. Uh, with When the pandemic gets behind us, I think um, Eugene will bounce back. I, I have a, a friend um, who went to college on the East Coast, which I thought was good, have a different experience. He was in New England somewhere, came back spring break last year and uh, got the word, do not return to campus. Your classes are gonna be on Zoom. And he had thought he was an unfortunate student because he had signed up for an, had to sign up for an 8.30 a.m. class, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So here's a college kid getting a Zoom class at 5.30 in the morning. I, I, you know, one of the few times I felt sorry for college kids. Anyway, uh, I think that uh, Eugene has some potential in the future. We're seeing a number of people wanting to leave 
the high cost, high congestion areas, San Francisco, Manhattan, Seattle, and they're mostly looking for cities. A few of them are trying small towns. I have lived in a small town and I tell you, I think those who are heading to really small towns are gonna come back to a city. They want some city amenities, some cultural amenities. And I think Eugene is well situated. The university provides a lot of cultural activities. I think, um, Eugene could conceivably be a, um, uh, a Zoom town, uh, but that's yet to be seen. Uh, in the next year or two, I think that um, uh, Eugene will grow a little faster just so that it comes to the recovery. Well, I've been talking about the regions, but let's take, I know what, what you're really looking for. I know you're really looking for me to uh, look into my crystal ball and come up with a more detailed forecast. I've got the crystal ball there. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what's going on. This is my forecast of the U.S. economy. I'll get to Oregon in just a moment. We have uh, uh, the solid blue is the actual, and we just got a, a data point. And then my forecast is that dotted line. And if you let your eyes sort of trace the history before the pandemic, and imagine the trend. We don't quite get up to that trend at the end of 2021, but we're pretty close to there by the end of 22. Uh, and that depends critically on the vaccine. But let me also add, we'll probably never get back to the trend we would have been on because of some permanent changes. There was some uh, re lower level of business capital spending early in the pandemic that will have lasting effects on our, our ability to produce goods and services. Some people, a lot of people actually, uh, retired earlier than they otherwise would have. So the labor force isn't quite as big. So we have a little less capacity. So we're not gonna get back up to that trend line. But I think that we are going to get there. Critical to that is vaccinations. And there's been a lot of frustration and irritation with our slow pace of vaccines. I think that the professionals in healthcare are going to figure it out, in healthcare and in public policy, are figuring it out. Uh, let us talk about one of the worst mistakes. Um, in New York, the governor said if you uh, vaccinate somebody in the wrong order, that is a $1 million fine. If, however, you waste a vaccine, that is a $100,000 fine. So these vaccines are thawed out. They have to be used in a very short time period. What do you do if you have an extra dose that uh, you don't have a, a person um, to, to vaccinate? Uh, in uh, New York, it's better to throw that dose away for the $100,000 fine than to give it to some random person for a million dollar fine. Uh, they have backed, the governor has backed away from that, but uh, Israel has the attitude that we need to drop more, adopt more broadly in the United States. Uh, there was a clinic with a dose that was about to expire. Everybody in the clinic had already been vaccinated. So a nurse went out on the street and sees a, a young man on a bicycle delivering a pizza. And she yells, pizza boy, pizza boy, do you want to be vaccinated? Come over here. So they vaccinated the pizza boy. You know, if we need to be willing to vaccinate the pizza boy, if that's the only person around. I am optimistic, but there are some risks here. And I want to emphasize that uh, this forecast is not, uh, is not guaranteed. First of all, uh, the virus has mutated. Viruses are famous for mutating and we have a more contagious version. We may have one uh, coming out that is a little bit more deadly and who knows what other um, mutations will develop. Uh, the vaccination process as well as the long-term effectiveness and safety of the vaccines. You know, we, we know what the short-term safety is. We don't know what six and 12 month out safety is. So there is some uncertainty. Plus at this time of great uh, confusion, there are plenty of other things that could happen, war, oil crisis. So um, I think that businesses should be flexible and ready to go in different directions. So this forecast is like I'm, I'm rolling the dice, you know, and um, uh, when uh, you're uncertain and you're rolling the dice, you know, you're working with the odds, but you have to recognize this is not guaranteed. 
the last time I was in uh, Vegas uh, at a casino uh, at the craps table, the guy next to me was having a lot of fun. He was really enjoying it. And uh, after winning uh, another uh, round, uh, he turns to me and says, isn't this fun? And I had to explain to him that it is less fun the more you've studied probability and statistics, but that's just the, the, the challenge of being an economist. Let's go back and um, look at some slides here. Uh, we're close to the trend line by the end of 2021 in Oregon. I think that uh, it'll look a little different. In Oregon, we don't have good dollar numbers on a contemporaneous basis. So we look at employment and remember it's more volatile than the dollars. I think that we're going to get close to our trend line Again, the first half of 2021, I think, will be slow progress. The second half, much faster progress. The second half of 2021 and on into 22. So that is my view of what's going on uh, for growth in 2021 and 2022. Now I want to talk about uh, political change. You may have heard that there's a new president of the United States and there is a lot of talk about uh, change, maybe even a little talk about unity, but you know, talk is cheap. I'm going to focus not on everything the candidate uh, Joe Biden um, said that he wanted to do, but about four areas that I think will have the biggest business impacts and go through them. The first is, I think we're going to get a stimulus relief bill. I prefer to call it a relief bill because stimulus uh, would apply if you believe the old fashioned Keynesian models, you're in a recession, and if you can throw some money into the economy, people will spend more, there'll be uh, ripple effects and um, everything will be hunky-dory. But that is not the constraint. Lack of money is not the constraint. People have stimulus, people in the aggregate have stimulus and they have not been spending their money. Uh, the stimulus checks, the $1,200 checks that came um, last year mostly went to pay off um, uh, credit card bills and to sit in checking accounts. We had a round of stimulus stimulus uh, last month, and I think that a new uh, package will be uh, relief. And the, the more it's targeted to the people who have lost their jobs, uh, the more beneficial it will be. But generally, um, throwing money at people is not going to be solving our problem. So I do not expect a big economic impact from that. Uh, now, the second item I want to talk about is uh, labor policy. If your business is um, in the situation where there's talk about uh, uh, unionization, uh, this is important to you, but it's not so important if your company is definitely not going to be unionized or already is unionized. But in the Obama administration, some of the, the rules were changed to make it easier for unions. And then um, the Trump administration reversed those rules. And now we're going back to the Obama era rules. For most businesses, it will not make a difference. I'm asked a lot about the $15 minimum wage, and I think that that will not pass, at least for a wage increase uh, right this year. There may be a compromise with a longer term phase in to $15. The challenge politically is that uh, there are many states whose economies depend on being uh, lower cost locations. Here in Oregon, you might think of a Grants Pass um, has trouble competing with uh, bigger cities, but the advantage it has is labor is a little bit cheaper down there. Uh, and even in liberal states, there are some uh, communities that uh, are low wages. Uh, New York State is generally a high wage uh, area. Elmira, New York in the western part, just north of Pennsylvania, is a relatively low wage area. So I think that even among the Democrats, there's going to be a little pushback to a sudden jump to $15 an hour. For Oregon businesses, not a lot of difference. I doubt that the federal minimum wage is going to jump above the Oregon minimum wage. So 
I think that uh, the wage that employees will be paying will be about the same. I do not expect significant stimulus to the economy from a $15 minimum wage. Yes, uh, some people will be making more, but there'll be fewer of them earning um, low wages because there'll be a substitution of equipment, computers for people, some outsourcing. So it will not be a stimulus to the overall economy. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, international trade. Yeah, international trade. This is an area where I think that the Biden administration will go in the same general direction as the Trump administration. The Democrats historically have not been as favorable towards globalization as uh, the Republicans have been, uh, but they're going to do it much more politely, I think uh, more gradually. They will do it in with greater collaboration of our, our major friends like the UK, Canada, Japan. Uh, we economists believe that uh, international trade benefits both sides. So we tend to favor more of a free trade approach. Uh, so I'm not in favor of continued move uh, towards restricting international trade. But if we're going to move in that direction, doing it uh, gently, uh, more predictably, more politely, I think is a positive development. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is uh, an infrastructure bill. I think we're going to get an infrastructure bill, uh, not right away. It'll take a long time. Maybe the second half of this year or the first half of next year, there will be a major infrastructure bill. Republicans like the idea. Democrats like the idea. Uh, there are no fiscal conservatives um, left uh, in Washington, D.C. It's a fully extinct species, apparently. So we'll get it. Uh, the uh, argument will be how you divvy up um, the spending. The Democrats will want, of course, the Green New Deal. Republicans will favor more traditional highways and bridges, but I think eventually they'll come to a, a compromise and there'll be a lot more money spent on infrastructure. Uh, the discussion reminds me of a lesson I learned my first year in a bachelor pad after I uh, got out of the college dorms, and that is when the pork turns greens, uh, turns green, things are not real happy. So that is what I see from uh, politics. Now I would like to turn to the lasting impacts of the uh, virus and the pandemic and how that's going to affect Oregon land use. So we've learned that we can work from home. This was my first home office when I left my um, uh, rented space on Cruiseway. I've been kicked out of that office, you know, family challenges, but it was a beautiful home office. But what we have generally learned is that working from home works for many people. Now, it doesn't work for the uh, people mowing my lawn. It doesn't work for the person driving a, a bulldozer on a construction site. But many, many people have been successful at working from home. Uh, some like it, but some don't. The people who like it uh, maybe never liked their work colleagues very much. Uh, uh, some folks report that they are uh, more productive. They have more flexibility about uh, when they walk the dog, you know, if there's a sun break at two in the afternoon and nothing scheduled, let's do it. But some people don't like working from home. They like the camaraderie. They've got animals or in-laws, which I guess are another form of animals, uh, and they don't want to be on a Zoom call and have a spouse in skivvies come walking behind them. And if you're worried, let me assure you, I have taken precautions to make sure that no spouse in skivvies walks behind me during this. Uh, I, that's good news for some of you, maybe not for all of you. But because we've learned that working remotely works and that some people like it, though some people don't, I think what we're going to find is a hybrid work model coming. Uh, some people will come into the office daily because that's what they want to do. Um, I th most cases, I think managers are going to want the whole team to come together. Maybe everybody in finance shows up in the office on Mondays. Everybody in marketing shows up on Tuesdays. Everybody in customer service shows up on Wednesdays. It will vary from company to company, but I believe that is going to be common for a lot of people to have the choice whether they work remotely or not. Oh, and that remote work can be working from home or it could be working from a co-working space, sort of a we work in the suburbs. Uh, 
And um, that could be my office depot has taken some of its floor space and made it into a co-working site. Or it could be that some executive uh, normally has been going downtown, but his company has a branch location near home. And he may say, hey, uh, all I want is a, a desk at the branch uh, for four days a week and the one day a week I'll go into work. So this remote uh, this hybrid work model, I think, is going to lead to a lot of variety. Some people will stay right where they are. Other people will change. And what we'll have is a preference for larger homes farther out. So if you're going to be working even a couple of days a week from home, you might think, oh, I'd like to have an extra bedroom. Or if you cannot, cannot afford an extra bedroom, maybe an apartment with an extra 30 or 40 square feet for a work location within the place. Well, more space costs more mon money, whether it's the price of the house or the rent on a rental unit, uh, it costs more money, but it tends to be cheaper farther out from the central city. So I think there's going to be a preference for people moving out the limitation on people moving out historically has been commuting time. People don't want to spend too much time uh, either driving in their car or riding a bus. And I think that bus and rail uh, transit is less attractive um, in an era of uh, pandemics. So, but uh, commuting is not a big deal if you're only going into the office once a week. And I think that people will say, hey, I can get the, the, the greater space that I want out in the suburbs. The commute is not the challenge it used to be. So there's gonna be a move out. And that's not everybody. Probably most people, and the way we economists tend to think of this is that in any change uh, in the environment, most people do what they've been doing, but there are some people in the middle. They could go this way, could go that way. And with this change in the environment, I think many of them are going to want to shift to a farther out location. But Oregon's land use policy has been focused on getting people close in, not expanding, not urban sprawl. And uh, that conflicts with I think a growing preference that we'll see for people in the outer areas. We also adopted our land use policy at a time when we had a lot of land inside urban growth boundaries and the people most responsible for our land use decisions were people of a mature generation, homeowners, maybe they had a second home at the beach or in central Oregon and they thought, uh, when I drive to my second home, I don't want to go past a subdivision. I'd rather go past a farm. And I don't believe that we thought very much about what that land use restriction meant for the young person trying to afford a first apartment or the young couple trying to afford a first house. Uh, but housing prices have gone up far more than they need to because of our land use policy. And I think we're going to have a conflict. How is it going to end? I think that we will probably eventually ease some of our land development restrictions, but I'm not talking 21 or <clears throat> 21 or 22. I'm talking several years out, five years out. But I think people in the real estate development area ought to think about where um, that controversy is going to land in coming years. So those are the primary uh, points I wanted to make. I'm going to give you some takeaways. You might start thinking about questions for the Q&A section um, and uh, typing those in to the Q&A uh, bar at the bottom of your window. The first is, of course, that we're going to have growth in 2021 and 2022. I would say that businesses should think about limitations, restrictions, challenges they will face with a growing economy. Now, when I talk to managers, it's like, yeah, yeah, give me growth, I'm, I'm all for growth. But uh, growth is not always easy, it brings challenges. Uh, growth brings a better set of challenges than recession, no doubt about it. But uh, for your organization to grow in sales, we need to add people. Where will you find those people? If you've laid off people, do you know if your people will be willing to come back? Have they found another job? Have they moved to Toledo? Uh, check in about the labor needs you may have. 
in a growth era, many companies start running short on working capital. What happens is there's a flurry of activity and many companies have to uh, spend money, whether it's on wages or on materials, they have to spend money faster than the money comes in. And their accountant says, gee, on an accrual basis, you're doing really well, but you have run out of cash. A uh, good approach to that is a cash flow forecast and a discussion with a banker who is willing to sit down and talk with you one-on-one -on -one about your own particular needs. And if you're banking with Summit Bank, you hit the jackpot because they've got a team of great bankers. Um, but there could be other challenges as well, um, machinery, equipment, real estate, and this is not a hard exercise. You can do it over a cup of coffee or other beverage of your choice with a single sheet of paper. Think through now what will be your challenges in a growing economy. On the political issue, uh, I mentioned the labor issues that will be more important in the coming days. And I believe that we're gonna have a tight labor market in the next decade. The best employee benefit is not on-site daycare. It is not yoga, not even goat yoga. The best benefit an employee can have is a good boss. When people quit, they seldom quit the job. They mostly quit the boss and uh, training to make your first level managers um, better at their job, better at keeping people engaged will really hugely help employee retention and the bottom line. And the third thing is for the Oregon land use issues, I think that we need to be ready for a dispute, a protracted political dispute over how we deal with land. And as we get ready to talk about, um, uh, take the questions in the Q&A section, let me mention that I put out a newsletter uh, once a month. I know many of you get it from your friends at Summit Bank. Uh, you can subscribe directly. Uh, you can uh, email me or uh, text the word ECON to 42828. Be happy to add you to the uh, list. With that, let's, uh, let's go back and um, take some questions. Jenny, have you been uh, accumulating questions? I, I have, but so far we, we don't have any questions. We, we did have- I think a couple showed up in chat maybe. Um, no, that was someone who was having, oh, having Zoom oh, okay. issues. We, wait, we wait, had- I'm we, looking at, I'm looking at Quite a few in the Q and A. I've Can got you, I've got zero. Go go for them, Scott. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Want me to? I'll I'll pitch a I'll pitch a uh, couple that I thought were interesting. Um, okay. Uh, there's a comment about the the Oregon cat tax that was passed last year. Um, do you think that 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 that's going to have a particularly uh, is significant impact combined with the pandemic? And do you think there's any chance that there's a, there's going to be a change there in the future uh, on the part of Oregon? Yeah, I, I believe the tax, it's not what I would have chosen, but I don't think it's going to be um, a huge factor on the economy, especially compared to recovery from the pandemic. And as for uh, some repeal of the tax or uh, a dialing down of the tax, uh, the governor feels that uh, she needs a lot, of, a lot more resources to deal with the greater needs. The uh, people in the majority party in the state house agree with that. I think it's um, highly unlikely that that is going to change. So it's not positive, but it is not going to be a huge negative, call it a minor negative. And then another one about the about the XL pipeline closure. Do you think the that in specific and the energy policy of the Biden administration is going to have uh, a material impact? Yeah, I believe that um, these changes, the pipelines, the uh, oil and gas drilling are not going to have a huge impact right away, but they will gradually accumulate over time and we'll see higher uh, energy costs because of that. Um, enough that uh, we can detect it if we look carefully, but it's not going to trigger a recession. And uh, another question generally about the, uh, the Biden tax plan, uh, increasing the top marginal long-term capital gains tax and additional uh, ACA tax. If, if, if indeed that's successful, what, what do you think about that? 
the the way I look at these tax changes, and I looked at the um, uh, the the Trump tax cut, and now the proposal for higher taxes is. Uh, the press is talking a lot about how many dollars go from this pocket to that pocket. What I look at is the incentive. And in a long, on a long-term basis, the, the tax policy that has the biggest effect on economic growth are taxes on investment. And they have a negative long-term impact. The second biggest impact uh, of taxes on the economy is taxes on income, particularly like labor income. Uh, there are some people who have a choice work or not work and they are tax sensitive, not every one of them, but in the aggregate, they are tax sensitive. Uh, whereas sales taxes, real estate taxes have uh, a negative impact on economic growth, but it's very, very small. So the, the taxes on investment returns and on labor uh, do impact long-term economic growth, but we're talking about, you know, does the economy grow at 2.5% or 2.3%? It's not going to be uh, recessionary, but it will uh, lower our long-term trajectory. Um, there's a fair number of questions just talking about inflation in general. That's kind of yeah. a standard idea when there's a lot of government stimulus. What do you, what do you think about uh, infl inflation expectations? Well, Scott, I was trying to avoid the subject because I'm trying to keep this a happy presentation. And we have a bunch of, you know, people in a good mood come here and then we have to deal with the bad news. Uh, the bad news happens after 2022, I believe. I'm not worried about inflation this year. I'm not worried about inflation in 2022, or at least most of 2022. But we've been throwing a lot of dollars into the economy, both from the fiscal stimulus, those checks and extra unemployment insurance payments, uh, payments to the states, plus the Federal Reserve has been throwing a lot of money into the economy. And the classic definition of inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. Too many dollars chasing too few goods. We've added a lot of dollars, but our productive capacity, as I mentioned, it has, is not growing. Uh, so we're gonna have inflation. But I don't think it's going to happen right away. I think it'll happen in 2023. We may start seeing signs of it late in um, 2022, but definitely 23 and 24, we're going to see an acceleration of inflation. Now, if you're an old timer, you may remember 10% inflation in 1980. Now, we're not going back there, but we're definitely going higher. And that presents a challenge because the Federal Reserve is committed to waiting waiting until they see the inflation. The old Federal Reserve from like a year ago said uh, they were gonna do the Gretzky move and uh, ski to where, uh, skate to where the puck is going to be, anticipate inflation. Uh, the new Fed under Powell has said, no, we're gonna wait because their forecasting models are pretty lousy. Wait until we see inflation. But there's a time lag of 12 months or so between cause and effect uh, when the Fed takes an action. So I think that we'll get inflation, the Fed will hit, tap the brakes and not much will change because of that time lag. They'll tap the brakes again, not much will change. And then uh, I fear that they may stomp down hard on the brakes causing a boom bust cycle. And I think that businesses should start thinking after we get through the pandemic, start thinking about flexibility for a boom bust cycle. And uh, the decade of the 2020s may resemble the 1970s where we had a recession and a boom, recession, boom. And this happened several times around. Mm, that is kind of that is kind of dark, Bill. Um, question related to you, you talked about sort of Zoom towns and people moving out of the city centers. Um, is there anyone measuring an impact on Oregon in particular with, with Portland? Do you think that, that there'll be an exodus from the Portland metro into, into environs of Portland? We don't quite know. Uh, the data that we have shows that um, Migration, population growth in the state, which is mostly the variation is mostly caused by migration, uh, was lower. Population growth nationally was lower because less foreign immigration. But um, we, we don't know for sure. Uh, we're flying vis visibility impaired. 
at the same time that I believe there are some folks uh, leaving Portland, um, maybe it's a fear of uh, ins insecurity from criminal activity with 911 calls not being answered and uh, more um, uh, neighborhood violence. Uh, or maybe it's just uh, tired of the high housing costs. There are certainly people moving out, but there are also people moving in saying, hey, Portland, uh, I saying Portlanders, you don't know high housing costs. I've been living in San Francisco or I've been living in Seattle. So right now, I think we're, uh, my guess is that we're in neutral territory where the people who say this Portland is better than the alternatives are about equally matched by people saying, hey, Portland is now not the best place for me. But it's going to be a couple of years before we really know to what extent people are moving. I'm nervous and I hope that the, uh, the, the civic leaders in Portland start uh, addressing some of the challenges that the city faces. So if, if inflation overall is tepid uh, in the short term, However, uh, there's a lot of escalation in commodities prices, uh, lumber and steel. Um, what, do, what do you see? What do you see the near term uh, future for for commodities, particularly construction commodities, I would imagine? Yeah, commodity prices are always much more variable than other other things um, than than rent or uh, labor costs. So, uh, and we've been in a construction boom. You know, I talked about people wanting houses. Well, uh, we had a lot of uh, housing units started uh, in 2020. Uh, in fact, we had more housing units started than we had additional people living in the country, uh, which uh, is a little bit scary. But the, the key factor there was the multifamily sector had momentum uh, big projects with long lead times. Uh, when the um, shift happened, uh, they just kept building those uh, multifamily units, completing projects that were already started. But uh, single family homes, more flexible, they can start and stop more rapidly. And that shift to more single family construction pushed up uh, the price tags on uh, construction materials, plumbing materials, copper and brass prices are up. And I think that we're not going to see, th this is not a harbinger of uh, massive inflation, but in the short run, demand changes much more rapidly than supply does. Um, you know, if uh, copper gets more expensive, yeah, we can open up um, or expand existing copper mines, but that doesn't happen quickly. So I think the commodity change is fairly short term. But if you're um, a developer, a builder, and you're trying to figure out what will it cost to build something six from, months from now, it is a tough challenge, and especially with the volatility of commodity prices, which is a long-winded way of saying, I don't know. So we have a, a couple over here. One person wants to know how Oregon PERS expenses will affect our state's growth. Can you answer that question? Yeah, yeah, Oregon PERS expenses. Of course, a substantial uh, portion of the cost of government, both state and local government in Oregon is the PERS contribution. And uh, it means that um, the taxpayers get less bang for the buck. And the, the PERS uh, high cost, contribution rates are a result of paying for past year's workers that we did not fully fund their pension obligations when those people were working 10 years ago. So now we're paying for the past. And when taxpayers say, oh, I'm going to get this service for this amount of tax, uh, the uh, PERS tax means the value received is less than the cost by a significant portion. And that's going to make people, I think, uh, uh, less uh, willing to pay for local bond issues like the metro bond issue that failed. I think there'll be a, a, an increased trend there. But it's one of the things that I think if you had a really detailed microscope, you could see the impact of this kind of policy on the growth rate, but the average person running a business or having a job is not going to notice the difference. Well, here's a tough one, Bill. Uh, your thoughts on the post-COVID hotel, restaurant, hospitality uh, business? Well, the restaurant business is easier to figure out. Uh, 
one of the things I do with uh, consulting clients is I say to them, uh, think about what has changed and what has not changed. And uh, what has not changed is that humans need to eat, not only need to eat, but want to eat. And I think uh, that will continue. I think that uh, there may be some folks with the, the new old habits of um, social distancing, but there are a lot of us with cabin fever. So I think re restaurants will bounce back pretty well. Some restaurants will be permanently closed, but there are plenty of locations suitable for restaurants plenty of people with uh, the talent to open a restaurant and even plenty of investors willing to help uh, those people open restaurants. So the closure of restaurants is, is not a scary thing to me. Restaurants open and close all the time. Um, travel and hospitality is a little bit um, dicier. I think that short trips like trips to the beach, trips to Bend uh, will bounce back fairly quickly. Uh, the cruises, cruises got a bad reputation, though they are booking uh, and, and we get brochures in the mail all the time. Uh, so some people go on cruises, but I think in the aggregate, uh, the cruises, the resort destinations will not be uh, bouncing back quite as quickly. We've got one. Well, here's a, leaders. here's we've a, a got, oh, sorry, I wanted to, the, we've had one in the chat for a while. This is from the Springfield Chamber and they want to know Knowing the government and legislative leadership is looking to raise revenues, what kind of worst case and best case or tolerable scenarios should we watch for? Those that will impact small businesses and economic recovery favorably or unfavorably? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think, um, you know, we could get uh, the cap and trade proposal. Uh, I like the idea of some kind of... Um, uh, tax on carbon as a substitute for tax on investment income and labor income. If you're going to tax something, let's tax the thing that you want less of, not the thing you want more of. Uh, but the problem has been that the leaders in the state house wanted to do both. Uh, and uh, it wasn't just a change in how we tax, it was uh, an addition of a tax. If there's going to be a raise in revenue, I think that maybe the cap and trade will be the most likely way, plus some um, uh, eating around the edges, uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, adjustment on minor fees. So uh, one of your listeners uh, is remembering what you said about Boise a few years ago. Uh-oh. Um, you said you predicted Boise would be the destination for young families due to economic opportunities, low cost of living, high quality of life. Um, are, are housing costs in Boise currently higher than you anticipated and are there lessons learned? You know, that forecast, uh, and I don't know if the caller was, is remembering, but I remember it was maybe 15 years ago at the Eugene Chamber. I said that uh, residents of Eugene should visit Boise because that is where your children are going to end up living. Uh, because at that time, housing was cheaper in Boise than in Eugene, and jobs were more abundant. And I use that as a little bit of a slap on uh, Eugene uh, policy about uh, growth and development. Uh, well, you know, that forecast really came out well. Uh, Boise is one of the, has been for the last 10 years, one of the fastest growing places in the country. Housing costs have gone up. They just simply cannot build housing fast enough for all the people who want to move to Boise. So I think that uh, I haven't done the comparison of Boise versus Eugene. Boise may now be more expensive than Eugene, but people are just piling in there. Uh, I have had been stunned at how low their unemployment rate could go. Um, and it got down to like two and a half percent, I think at its lowest. So uh, Boise has been booing. What was there, Scott, was there more to the, the question than just uh, how Boise is doing? Uh, no, it was just uh, saying that it looks like Boise is not quite so affordable uh, anymore. And, uh, right. th th and are they higher than you anticipated the getting, the, the housing costs? Yeah, I was optimistic uh, about uh, Boise's growth, but it surpassed my uh, optimism. What's what's your Oregon Ag forecast for twenty one and twenty two? How do how do you see the impact uh, of there? 
Well, the easiest thing to say, talk about is uh, nursery crops, uh, which is, of course, a huge industry, um, especially in the Valley. I think that will be strong. Um, there are a lot, I was talking to a Midwestern nurseryman um, just yesterday, and he says there's a lot of new, a lot of new gardeners out there, especially millennials. Uh, the industry had been enjoying people retiring and taking up and spending more time gardening, but now millennials are uh, gardening. Uh, they're hoping for a boost there, limited by uh, labor costs. Uh, the lack of new uh, commercial development is a limiting factor there because there's a lot of landscaping on that, uh, but I think that will come back. Uh, for other crops, I think that... Um, uh, we'll see prices that, and I don't follow things like wheat uh, that closely. Uh, there's a challenge with the export market, but I think that uh, we'll see roughly stability. I don't see a big swing going on in, in ag. So somebody's piggybacking on your Boise comment. Uh, what's the new Boise if you look out 10 years? Oh, I think that Boise will continue to grow, uh, but they will, you know, they're limited like Bend is by how many construction workers there. Um, right now, anybody with a, um, a pickup truck and a claw hammer is a contractor in Boise, uh, and that is limiting their ability to build new houses. But Boise has a different attitude. Uh, Boise's attitude has been, uh, you know, if you want to build it, We'll help you. And some years back, uh, one of the suburbs offered a guarantee to builders saying, hey, when your permit is completed, uh, we'll give you an answer in two weeks or something like that. It was a service guarantee to builders. And then another suburb said, we can't let them be the only one with a service guarantee. So the suburbs were competing to get development, whereas in Oregon, the suburbs would be competing to stop development. So th that's their attitude. I think uh, it may change. That happens as people get a little bit older, but um, uh, as they get more crowded, but I think that uh, Boise will continue to expand faster than the national average. And do you have an out, of, out on the limb kind of forecast for what might be the next metro that, that has uh, attractive cost of living um, similar to what you're saying about Boise 15 years ago? Yeah, you know, Coeur d'Alene's been doing well. I think Spokane is doing fine. I know a company that acquired, um, did an acquisition and ended up with a back office uh, accounting folks in both Spokane and Boise. And their attitude usually in an acquisition is, okay, we get rid of the, um, the back office people. Um, but what they said is, oh, we've got a core of back office people in lower cost locations. And they went to their Seattle back office people and said, does anybody want to move to Spokane or, or Boise? And hands went up left and right. Uh, so <clears throat> there is a migration to lower cost areas. I think that college towns will look good. And I think that um, some of the smaller cities, um, people, cities of, you know, the quarter million is a little bit small, but uh, half a million to one million cities will probably be the sweet spot across the country. What about so traditional another, brick and mortar? Tra traditional brick and mortar in, in Eugene. Uh, how do you see that coming back? I think there will be some brick and mortar, but um, not too much of it. Uh, you know, people have learned to do online shopping and I think that's going to uh, continue for a while. So for stores, um, that is going to be tough. And Eugene is not so big that uh, it's got a big disparity between downtown and suburbs. Um, so I don't think the movement to the, in Portland, I think that the shift of people wanting to live in the suburbs will stimulate commercial development in the suburbs, in Eugene, maybe not so much. Um, hey, we're getting close to the end of time. Uh, is there one last question and then I'll make some uh, closing remarks? Not in the chat. Okay, Scott, you got one last? Uh, just a, a general, uh, give you a chance to, you know, be a genius or a goat, uh, industry types that, that you see particularly thriving uh, in the next couple of years? Uh, industry types. 
Yeah. You know, I th we have been um, spending a lot of time taking care of our homes since we're spending more time in our homes. Uh, the folks who do carpet and drapes, um, Home Depot has been doing well with do-it-yourself projects. I think a lot of that, though, was borrowing from the future, and people did a lot of activity uh, in 2020 that they would have otherwise done. Uh, I think probably uh, once we get over the fear of COVID, uh, then uh, travel would, would be the big uh, recovery area. Let me make some, some closing remarks, and I'd like to talk about um, oh, this. Hold on. Let me make a little change here. Those who had a, a question uh, that we didn't answer, feel free to email me, uh, and you can uh, send a text to get on the, the newsletter list. Happy to take your questions. Just mention you're on the Summit Bank uh, presentation so that I can separate your email from the groupies and, and um, stalkers who so bedevil handsome young economists. But I want to talk about some challenges that America has had in the past. We've faced a number of challenges. We've had high aspirations. We haven't always lived up to our aspirations, but challenge after challenge we have overcome. And we have provided freedom and prosperity to a wider swath of our population than any other country in the world in history. We're going to overcome this challenge and we're going to make further progress towards our goal of freedom and prosperity for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Connerly. That was a wonderful presentation and the first time that we've heard you for all of our markets on Zoom. Um, for those of you out there, if you are interested in um, getting a copy of this presentation, contact your banker and they will send it to you and can also send you the slide deck. And if you have any ideas for future Zoom presentations, either topics or speakers, let your banker know. We really appreciate all of your time today and we hope that you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. And as we like to say here at Summit, Summit on three. So thanks all. Thanks, Dr. Connerly. Thanks.